Fresh off a recent staff retreat, we are all recharged, refreshed, and ready for new adventures this fall as we partner together with you to make the name of Jesus famous in the Coachella Valley and beyond. This is Southwest Church Online. Hey everyone, my name is CJ McFadden, your online pastor, and I couldn't be more excited that you chose to worship here with us today. As I mentioned, we just got back from a recent staff retreat and what a wonderful time it was. We had some great opportunities to worship, pray and play as we prepared for this next season of ministry. I share this all with you to say thank you for your encouragement, support and prayers so that we could have this opportunity together as a staff. We are more excited than ever for some of the new things we believe God is up to here at Southwest. Stay tuned as we begin to share more about it right here in the near future. Now, we've got some exciting stuff planned for our service today, including some special announcements and updates live from Pastor Ricky right after our worship together. Welcome to Southwest Church. Uh, Let's start things off with Psalm chapter 9, verse 1 through 2. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. So let's lift our voices as we sing about our unfailing God. Put your hands together. I want to dance like David, I want a faith like Paul, I want to sing like Silas tearing down those prison walls, I want to face that fire, it won't burn me though, God's got my back, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, I want to walk like Moses, right through the waves, one day I'll see that promised land no longer slaves, though the fear is talking, No, I can't take out my faith I'm gonna praise, I'm gonna praise I praise a mountain moving body Razor breaker a chain Gonna praise, I'm gonna praise I praise a heaven seated undefeated Highest of names, that's who I praise Hey, that's who I praise That's who I praise I want a gift like Mary, I want to break my face I want to sleep like Daniel even in a lion's cave I'm gonna get that promise just like Jericho Yeah, I know what'll make it fall I'm gonna praise, I'm gonna praise I praise a mountain moving body raising breaker and chains Gonna praise, I'm gonna praise I praise the heaven seated, undefeated, highest of names. That's who I praise. Hey, I praise a God who's proven He can do impossible things. That's who I praise. Hey, that's who I praise. That's who I praise. He is a lion of Judah. He is a lamb that was slain. The only one who's worthy, worthy, worthy of all of his names. That's who I praise. He is a risen Messiah. He is the ancient of days. The only one who's worthy, worthy, worthy of all of his names. That's who I praise. I'm gonna praise. I praise a mountain moving body raising breaker of chains Gonna praise, I'm gonna praise I praise a heaven seated undefeated I is the name, that's who I praise Hey, I praise a God who's proven He can do impossible things That's who I praise Hey, that's who I praise That's who I praise That's who I praise, that's who I praise. 
want to love like Jesus, that kind of grace. I want to live like I've got no more precious time to waste. I'm going to give him glory with all my thanks. Cause there's no greater, stronger, higher name. That's who I praise. That's who I praise. Sing it. That's who I praise. That's who I praise. That's who I praise. Hallelujah. We serve a God a loving God. Amen. And we serve a God of second chances. That every time I, I make a mess of myself, He's there to restore us. So sing this song with me today. You've been good so me. So good for me. Better to me than I could ever have hoped you would be. You took the mess that I was and you have done some incredible things you've been better to me than i could hope hope you would be you took the mess that i was and you have done some incredible things you always knew there was a better me but you loved me like i was filling up the spaces in between always been enough nobody else is good nobody else is kind nobody has to lay their life down on the line nobody else can do it even if they try nobody else could ever save Every time you've been just that good, you're good to me. You've been just that good, so good to me. Lord, without your love, where would I be? Oh, my God, you sure been to me if he's been good to you can you praise him this morning you are making me into something that I would have never have seen you are doing exceedingly more than I could ever have dreamed you are making me into something that I would never have seen doing exceedingly more than I could ever have dreamed. You always knew there was a better me, as you loved me like I was. Filling up the spaces in between, you've always been enough. Nobody else has good, nobody else has kind. Nobody else can lay the light down on the line. Nobody else can do it, even if they try. Nobody else can come and save me every time. Can you sing that out with me? You've been just that good. You're good to me. Been just that good, so good to me, Lord. Without your love, where would I be? Oh, my God, you sure been good to me. Oh, you've been good to me. Oh, you've been good to me. Yeah. 
it and I won't forget it And I'm praising you because You didn't leave me like I was You didn't have to save my soul But you did and I won't forget it You didn't have to take my shame But you did and I won't forget it God, I just, I thank you for your goodness in this moment, that your goodness doesn't leave us where we are, but it molds and refines us to where we need to be, Father God. Lord Jesus, that we acknowledge that it's a privilege to be refined by you, and that we look more and more like you every single day, Father. Take me there, take me there What you need is just an offering It's right here, my life is here And I'll be a living Sacrifice for you You're a fire, the refiner I wanna be consumed I wanna be tried by fire Purified, you take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. I wanna be tried by fire. Purified, you take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my life. If your glory wants to come in. 
let it fall We want it all Your fire is consuming Fill this place Set it ablaze And I'll be a living Sacrifice for you You're a fire The refiner I wanna be consumed I wanna be tried by the fire a sacrifice I want to burn for you only for you so clean my hands and purify my heart I want to burn for you oh, oh, only for you oh, so take my You're a fire, the refiner I wanna be consumed I wanna be tried by fire Pure refine You'll take whatever you desire Lord, is my life I wanna be tried Pure God, we do offer up our lives to you. God, I pray that you would humble us and that, would see you, that we would see you working in our lives, God. May you be glorified in our praise, lifted high in our worship, God, and seated high on your throne for what you deserve. God, we pray all this in your name. And all of God's people said, amen. Take your seats, say thank you to the worship team and give God praise for how they led us uh, this morning. God bless you. Take a seat and welcome everybody to Southwest Church. It is so good to see you. Our God is good and all the time. Our God is good. Thank you so much. My name is Ricky, and on behalf of the family here, thanks for being with us for worship of the name of Jesus Christ uh, today. It's just exciting to have all of you here in the room, everyone who's worshiping with us live stream around the world. It is good for us to be here today. We love new people, and some of you are new. It's your first time, second time, or third time. 
And we just want you to know we want to do whatever it takes to make sure that you feel at home because you belong here at Southwest Church. There's a blue card that's in front of you. There's a QR code on there where you can check out a little bit about our church. Make sure that you avail yourself to maybe just tap in at the next steps table in the back of the room or on the way to pick up your kids after service so we can welcome you about what God is doing here at our church. We're going to go ahead and worship in the way of our giving. Acts chapter 2, when the church was born, it speaks of this moment of revival where all of the believers and followers of Jesus literally uh, entered into something called shared sacrifice. And everybody allowed the Spirit to lead each family, and they brought what they had to the Lord's table. And because everybody brought what they had, hunger went away. Because everybody brought what they had, anyone who was in lack, all of their needs went away. That's the beauty of the church. So thank you always for shared sacrifice of bringing what God has led you to give to God's table. And so those volunteers are going to come now. We're going to raise that offering. If you want to do that online today, there are some instructions that are coming up on screen as to how you can do that. When you give, it helps our staff take care of the valley. When you give, it helps us give away free candy to children and ruin the lives of parents tonight at Trunk or Treat. Can you say amen for Trunk or Treat tonight? Y'all excited? Oh, we are so excited. Be back here at 5 o'clock tonight. We expect a few thousand people from around the valley dressed up like who knows what. I'm sure there'll be a few Captain Americas on campus tonight just to bless them. We made a challenge. Even if you're not a child and this is not your thing, would you tonight establish a ministry of presence? We want our community to know just how warm and how loving and how welcoming this church is. So we're excited about Trunk or Treat tonight. Uh, if you are new to us next Sunday, I want to invite you to a lunch. Um, in the name of Jesus Christ, a free lunch, which means this lunch is the same price as salvation. Okay, some of you will get that on the way home. But anyways, if you're new to us and you've been wanting to check out Southwest, I want to invite you next Sunday after the third service, about 12.30 p.m., to a meeting we call Intro to Southwest. I'd love to meet you. My wife would love to meet you. We want to tell you our story. We want to tell the story of our church. And then we want to talk about your story and what it looks like for you to start journeying along this pathway of discipleship at Southwest Church. Register for it via the QR code that's there on the slide, also online. We would love to have you join us next Sunday afternoon. A free lunch. I asked what the menu was. I've heard 64-ounce tomahawk ribeyes. I've heard uh, there'll be some St. Louis-style spare ribs and baby backs, okay? Uh, baked potatoes with all the fixings, all that and more will be available at your favorite restaurant after the free lunch that we're serving. Uh, we will have something from Costco, but it will be free in Jesus' name. So next Sunday, I hope to see you at Intro to Southwest. Um, I'm going to introduce our speaker in just a moment. We're going to shake hands with one another. But we wanted to create some space. Just a, a few days ago, the world celebrated something called uh, Global um, Mental Health Awareness Day. And we got to thinking maybe this is a good opportunity for us to talk about Southwest's contribution to mental health care uh, here in the Valley. Um, something um, started to happen in my, my heart and in my life uh, a few years ago. Remember the pandemic and everything was shut down and it was just crazy uh, for a while. Um, maybe, maybe, you, maybe, maybe you didn't know, but that was a little tough for us <laughs> and it was tough for me. And I remember that, wow, for the first time in my life, I'm going through some sophisticated stuff that I re really just don't know how to, to grapple with. And I decided to get some counseling. And I started seeing a biblical licensed professional counselor. And it was such a blessing in my mind and heart that I continue to see a counselor once a month just to make sure that I got what I need to do what I need to do. And I'm not ashamed uh, to say that sometimes when you're going through some sophisticated stuff, you need to get some sophisticated support. This was the very beginning of a vision in my heart for a Christian counseling center at Southwest Church. Because I got to thinking, maybe I'm not the only one who could use somebody from time to time to talk to, and that vision was born. So last year, we asked you guys for a generous offering called Make Jesus Famous, 
and you guys, we asked you for $2 million. You guys were in total disagreement with that. You gave us $3 million. And we give God thanks for that. And one of the initiatives we launched was the Southwest Christian Counseling Center. We now have a fully licensed professional mental health biblically based counseling center right on this campus. And we give God praise for that. And today we thought we'd uh, introduce the team to you and talk a little bit about why we do that. So our counselors who are fully employed here at Southwest Church are here. Would you put your hands together for Rochelle Roberts, Marcia Lewis, Anthony Burks, and Karina Moreno who are here. Come on, let them hear it and give God thanks. So we're so excited about what God has been doing over the last several months, so many stories, but we have Rochelle here who is our director, and she is awesome, okay? And so just to give us a little bit of vision in the what's and the what's nots of the Counseling Center, Rochelle, when we say Christian Counseling Center, what do we even mean? Well, one of the main things is, is that all of our staff, our counselors are all Christians that are on fire for God and consider this counseling center a ministry. And that is powerful. They're also licensed professional counselors. So they're licensed with the, the state of California to, to practice, as well as they're educated and trained with a wide variety of, of uh, counseling uh, modalities or training so that they can serve the needs of the Coachella Valley. Wow, wow. So Rochelle, we're out here, we're sitting in the seats today, we're online. Who is the person that should take advantage of the fact that Southwest has a counseling center? Yes, you know, counseling is good for really anyone. You know, you may be a teenager that's suffering with anxiety because of all the stuff that's going on in the world, or perhaps a um, mother who's overwhelmed and depressed perhaps a man dealing with anger issues, or a couple that had such high hopes for their relationship and now there's broken trust and broken hearts, or perhaps a senior who is going into the holiday season with um, some grief because their partner is not gonna be there with them. Those are some people that can benefit, Pastor. I love that, I love that. Well, finally, we are here ready to make this place famous for Jesus' name because we want to change our valley. We want to reach every family in our valley. So what do you need us to do for the Counseling Center? Well, first of all, I need you guys to make sure that you keep us on your prayer list. Keep us uh, praying for us so that we can move in the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can reach this Coachella Valley. But also I need your help to spread the word. Spread the word, go out and tell your friends and your family, the community, the chatty cash, cashier at Walmart, whoever you need to tell that we are here to serve them. As well as you can go to, by scanning the link, you can, uh, on, and you're gonna also be getting a card when you leave today, but you can scan the link there, the um, QR code, and it will be able to uh, tell you more information about the Counseling Center. That's so awesome. And I am a witness that that cashier at Walmart is very chatty. Okay, let us celebrate what God is doing by praying a prayer over the Counseling Center. So brothers and sisters, would you stretch your hands towards this team as we believe God for great things. So Father, we bless your holy name and we thank you, God, for giving us a vision to say, Lord God, you care about the whole person. You care about their hearts and you care about their minds. So Father, we pray for the Southwest Christian Counseling Center that you would anoint these counselors from the crowns of their heads to the soles of their feet. We pray for the families and the individuals and the leaders and the people that they will engage with, asking God that there will be whole scale healing in Jesus' name. I pray, Father God, for mental health in this valley and that our mental health would increase. But Lord, I pray another prayer that that mental health would be a natural doorway to spiritual health. And I pray, God, that as a result of this counseling center, not only will people get mentally well, but many will learn that there is a name that's above every name, that they will come in a relationship with Jesus Christ. So we pray for victory over the Counseling Center, and we pray it in Jesus' name. And every heart said, amen. Y'all give it up one more time for our counselors of the Southwest Christian Counseling Center. 
We're, we're going to take a little mini break and get ready for God's word. If you're here, we'd love for you to high five a couple of people, connect with them and say, the Dodgers are going to win four straight in Jesus name. So go ahead and say, hey, and connect with your neighbor real quick and say, welcome to Southwest Church this morning. Well, again, it is so very good to see you this morning. In so far that tonight is trunk or treat, this morning we have a gospel treat. One of my favorite preachers on earth, on earth. Earth, that's a big place, and this is one of my favorite preachers on earth. He is none other than my dear friend, my brother, a mentor of mine, a gentleman who goes by Pastor Dudley Rutherford. I like to call him Bishop. The Bishop is here. I give God praise for Dudley. He's been pastoring the Great Shepherd Church in the Los Angeles area over 35 years. They minister about 12, 13,000 people every weekend. He hosts a radio show where he makes the name of Jesus Christ famous. He is an avid evangelist and just loves preaching God's word. He and his wife Renee, their kids, their grandkids have been friends with me and the Jenkins for about, I don't know, seven years almost. This morning, uh, Dudley uh, greeted my children and he gave them nerds candy so he could ruin my afternoon as these children are bouncing off of the walls. I love this man of God. He's going to preach. It's going to bless you. I dare you to make him feel welcome. Would you put your hands together and welcome with me, Pastor Dudley Rutherford. You doing? Give your pastor a warm welcome. Come on, come on, come on. Good morning, good morning. Let's thank our worship team. Did we do that already? Let's thank them again. Come on, they deserve that. I do, I, I do love your pastor. I have a man crush on him, and that's okay. It's, it says in the book of Leviticus you can do that. Uh, but I think uh, that Ricky is, for me, the best uh, preacher, pastor in the country. I know a lot of good preachers who are terrible at pastoring. And I know a lot of good pastors who stink at preaching. But somehow, your pastor is good at preaching and pastoring. Amen. And uh, we, we just have a lot of fun. And just so you know, we talk a lot. And uh, we don't talk about our golf scores. We don't do that very often. Um, we don't talk about the weather. We don't talk about politics. Whenever we're together, we're talking about the church, how to grow a church, how to lead a church, how to make disciples, what's working and what. We do talk about food some. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I know last month, you've probably already done this, it was uh, Pastor Appreciation Month. I don't know what you did for your pastor, but I, I really want you to show just a round of applause, how much you love your pastor and his wife, April, down here. And Ricky, is that your daughter right here too? I tell her I have some nerds for her too. I, 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 don't, I don't want her to feel like she got left out. I have a whole package of nerds back there. If she wants to go get them right now, she can go get them. So my wife's not here, but she's coming at the third service today, and she told me, she gave me very inst strict instructions. She said, Dudley, when you go preach for Ricky today, whatever you do, do not try to be charming, don't try to be witty, don't try to be intelligent. She said, just be yourself. So <laughs> that, I'm gonna try to do that today. How many Dodger fans do we have in church today? I just wanna know. The Dodgers are a storied franchise that actually started 141 years ago in 1883. They were known as the Brooklyn Dodgers. And then they moved to Los Angeles in the year 1958. They were the first team to ever move to the West Coast. They have won seven World Series, 24 National League pennants. 
They've had some great players through the years, Don Drysdale, Sandy Koufax, Oral Hershiser, Clayton Kershaw, Pee Wee Reese, Maury Wills, the great Fernando Valenzuela who just passed away. Uh, also, Steve Garvey, who's from the Valley here. I, if you ever, uh, if you ever uh, have breakfast on uh, El Paseo, just stop there at uh, Coffee Bean and sit out. You'll see him walk, walk by almost every day. And I guess he's running to be the United States Senator, is that correct? Um, but the greatest, the greatest Dodger who ever has ever lived, I have a picture of him, is Jackie Robinson. And Jackie Robinson broke baseball's color barrier on April 15th, the year 1947. He's a Hall of Famer. He helped speed up the civil rights movement in our country with his perseverance and professionalism as a Major League Baseball player. But two nights ago, in the first game of this year's World Series, a new hero was born. The Dodgers are playing the dreaded New York Yankees. Are there any Yankee fans in the house today, right here? Ricky, these people all need to be rebaptized. I'm serious. Game one, two nights ago, Freddie Freeman comes to the plate, bases loaded, bad ankle, bottom of the 10th, the Dodgers behind, three to two, there's two outs, and this is what happens. Now the kind of an event that every kid that plays baseball dreams of one day happen. You tell yourself, right, all right, bottom of the 10th, bases loaded, World Series, one run game, Dodgers, Yankees. Reality for Freddie Freeman right here. Cortez delivers. Freeman hits the ball to right field. She is gone! Gabby, meet Freddie! Game one of the World Series! As it was on an October night 36 years ago, a hobbled game one hero for the Dodgers. Freddie Freeman with a walk-off grand slam to win game one of the World Series, 6-3 over the Yankees. Unbelievable. I mean, there's just no way to describe it. Would you say you don't believe what you just saw? How many of you were blessed that you were blessed by that grand slam right there? Today, I wanna to do something unique. I wanna actually use the baseball diamond as an analogy, I want to speak to you on the subject, the basis of our faith. I want you to remember that last scene when he jumped up and landed on that home plate and everybody went, was cheering there. I want to take you on a journey around the base paths. Now, there's nothing wrong, just in case you are wondering, there's nothing wrong with using sports as a spiritual analogy or illustration because the Apostle Paul did it all throughout the scriptures. In Hebrews chapter 12, Paul said, let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. So he, he knew about the, the Greek games and how they used to run these races. In Ephesians chapter six, Paul said we wrestle not, to use a, a wrestling analogy to talk about the spiritual warfare that we are all in. In 1 Corinthians chapter nine, he said, I do not fight like a man beating the air. So he must have been aware of, uh, of the boxing world. You know, there's an old joke that where is baseball in the Bible? In fact, it's mentioned in the very first verse, Genesis 1-1, it says in the big inning. How many of you knew that? You already knew that. <laughs> so today we're gonna use a simple baseball diamond. That's going to be our outline. So base number one, first base. Everybody say first base. First base is what we will call salvation in Jesus. Salvation in who? Jesus. In Jesus. That is the initial step. A baseball player, a runner, cannot go to second base. He cannot go to third base. He cannot go home until he first touches first base. So from one angle, First base is the most important base. Now, a couple of quick things I just want to mention. First of all, 
we are all sinners. The Bible says in Romans 3.23 that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin is inside of every single person. Now, I'm talking about from the pulpit to the back row. I'm talking about to the furthest person over here, to the furthest person back there. This room, look around, is full of sinners. We already had some uh, Yankee fans acknowledge that they're Yankee fans. Now just show of hands, how many of you today, the Bible says we've all sinned, how many of you would raise your hand and acknowledge, yeah, I, I have sinned somewhere. Raise your hand, look at all the sinners, and if you see someone without their hand up, they are the biggest sinner in here. And uh, you know, every time you see a bank, a bank is proof that men are sinners because if men were not sinners, you could leave your money in the mailbox and it would be safe. But don't do that because someone will steal it and will probably be one of your relatives. Every police officer you see is proof that men are sinners because if we all kept the law, there would be no need for police officers. So every time I see a police officer, it just reminds me that we are all sinners. The second thing I want you to note here is that we need a savior. And the only person who can save us is someone who had never sinned, and that would of course be Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us in Romans 5, 8 that God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, that Christ died for us. I had a Jewish man this week ask me, he said, I don't understand what that means, that Christ died for us. He just couldn't figure that out. And so, of course, I explained how sin is within all of us and that sin is what separates us from God, that there's a penalty for that sin, and that we should have been the ones who should have died but the Bible says that Christ died for us, that Jesus literally crawled up on the cross and paid the penalty for all of our sins. Can you say amen to that, please? The Bible tells us in Hebrews 5, I wanna read this text. During the days of Jesus' life on this earth, he, Jesus, offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. Of course, that was on the cross. And verse nine says, and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. So salvation is available to anyone who obeys Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of times it's confusing, like what, is, what does it mean to obey Jesus Christ? And as I've looked at the Bible, you find all these words that are related to being saved. I, I wanna put them on the screen and show them to you. You have the word believe, you have the word repent, you have the word confess, you have the word be baptized. And those things are all in the Bible. John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believeth in him shall not perish but shall have everlasting life. So you need to believe, you need to be a believer. You need to believe that Jesus is the son of the living God, amen? And then Luke 13, three says you have to repent and that word means you're living a certain way and you decide that it, it, you, you understand that it's the wrong way and so you repent, you turn your life back to God and Jesus was the one in Luke 13, three said that unless you repent, you're going to end up perishing. Then you have this word confess in Romans 10, nine and 10. It says that you have to believe with your heart, all your heart, uh, that Jesus uh, you know, came back from the grave but you have to confess, it says, with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. So I've gotta believe, I gotta repent, I gotta confess. And then in Acts chapter two, verse 38, it says that every person should be baptized into the name of the Father and the Son 
and the Holy Spirit. And so you have these different verses in the Bible that talk about believing and talk, verses that talk about repentance and verses that talk about confession. There's all kinds of verses in the Bible about being baptized. So, so what does it mean to obey Jesus Christ? I think it means that you've got to do all those things. And if you do all those things, that is how you are putting your trust in Jesus. But the point is that there are not one, there's not two steps, there's not three steps, there's not four steps to salvation. There's only one step to salvation, and that's when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You believe in him and you repent, you turn to him, you confess that he is Lord, and then you're baptized into a watery grave. So first base in our little diagram is salvation or conversion to Jesus Christ. Now that takes us to base number two. And second base is the church. When you obey, when you obey and put your faith and trust in Jesus, that automatically places you on second base. That's the church. Now here's the problem. We have so many people that get saved, first base, and then they sneak across the pitcher's mound and go to third base and try to sneak home. And they leave the church of Jesus Christ out all together. You say, well, can I be a Christian and not be a part of the church? Read my lips. No, you cannot. The moment, I want you to get this, the moment you touch first base and you are saved in Jesus Christ, that moment you surrender to Christ, at that moment you automatically become a part of the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the church. In the Greek, the word church is the word ekklesia. And the word ekklesia means the called out assembly. Everybody say the word assembly. That's what it means. It's an assembling of people who have put their faith and trust in Jesus. The church is an assembly of people who have believed in Jesus. It is an assembly of people who have repented to Jesus. It's an assembly, it's an assembly of people who have confessed his name and who have been baptized into his name. There has to be an assembly. That's what the church is. Now, it might be on top of a mountain. It might be in a cave. It might be out on a street corner. It might be inside a beautiful building, but there must be an assembly. That's what the word church means. Now, Hebrews chapter 10, you know this verse. It says, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. I know a lot of people who say they're saved, but they got out of the habit of going to church. Some things are bad habits, some things are good habits, and some things are biblical habits. And meeting together every week, the church gathering together is a biblical habit. Can someone say amen? I would like to have you take an honest test, an honest inventory, and ask yourself, how often do you go to church? Do you go every week? Do you go once a month, twice a month, three times a month, or four times a month? The average in America today is 1.6 times a month. Some people only go to church on, uh, uh, on Easter and Christmas. It's the only time they go. There's a lot of people, they only go one time a year, and that's on Easter. My dad, who was a pastor, on Easter morning, I heard him say this many times, on Easter, largest crowd, he would say, I'd like to wish those of you that will not be here again till next Easter, I'd like to wish you a Merry Christmas. <laughs> but there are always those who say, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't attend church. And I say to you, that's not only impractical, impractical, that's not even possible. The moment you get saved, God places you in that church. 
And there's always people, I've got them all the time who say, Pastor, I just, and, and Ricky, this drives me, this drives me insane. I, I get crazy on Sunday afternoons when I see people posting themselves in their house, in their living room, in their bathrobe, drinking their coffee on the TV screen watching me preach. And they call that church. And I always say, that's not church. Now there's nothing wrong with that if you wanna stay home every Sunday in your pajamas, drinking coffee, watch it on the screen. I say knock yourself out. But if that's what you truly believe, then next week there won't be two of you, there'll be four of you. The next week there'll be six of you. The next of you there'll be eight. Next week there'll be 10. Because if you're truly the church in your house, it's not just gonna be you sitting there every week, it's you out doing the work of the Lord and you inviting more people to come to your house to watch that service. And I will tell you this, almost every large church in the United States of America started with someone just staying at home saying, we're gonna start church here in our house. And it grew and it grew and it grew until eventually they had to get a building. So you keep meeting in your house if that's what you like to do and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Third base, we gotta get to third base. First base is salvation. Second base is the church. Third base is serving, Christian service. Now we've got a lot of people, Ricky, who get saved they get to church, and then they just sit there, like in a rocking chair, and they rock, and they rock, and they rock, and they rock. Never do anything, but they're in church, rocking and rocking and rocking. I want you to know that we are saved to serve, we are called to serve, and we are gifted to serve. I'm gonna say that again. We are saved to do what? We are called to do what? We are gifted to do what? Serve. I know people who've come to church, I've been there for 38 years at my church, I know people who've come for 38 years and they really have never done anything except warm a chair. And I, this goes through my head and I know I'm a weird person. I go, you know, if a chicken sits that long, at least it hatches something. <laughs> Listen to these words. Romans 12, we have different gifts according to the grace given to us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If he has the gift of serving, let him do what? Serve. If he has the gift of teaching, let him do what? Teach. If he has the gift of encouraging, let him encourage. If he has the gift of contributing to the needs of others, then let him give generously. If he has the gift of leadership, let him govern diligently. If he has the gift of showing mercy, let him do so cheerfully. There's two things I want you to know or to ask. The first question is what gifts and talents do you have that God put inside of you? I want you to think, what are you good at? What did God put inside of you that you're good at doing? And the second question is how are you deploying those gifts? You see, I don't think God gave Ricky the ability to preach so that he could go inside a little closet, shut the door, look at a mirror, and just preach to himself. No, God gave him that gift so he could stand here in this church and use that gift to bless each and every one of you, amen? I can't play the piano, but if I did, play, if I did have that gift, I don't think God would give me that gift so I could get into a little closet, shut the door, get me a little piano, get a little mirror there, and just play the piano to myself. I don't believe that. I think if God gave me the ability to play an instrument that I would, the reason he gave me that gift so that I could use it in church to bless the entire body of Christ. Whatever gifts you have, what, 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 what are you good at? Well, there's, you're good at something. What are you good at? And whatever that is, you should be using that for the body of Christ, amen? Now, I'm gonna use an illustration here. I, but I need a volunteer. I need someone who has never, ever, ever, been inside this building. This is the first time you've ever walked into church. Maybe the last. <laughs> is there anyone here this is the first time you've ever been here? First time. Patty, I know her. Come on up here. She's a friend of mine. Patty, you gotta come up here, sorry. This is Patty, give Patty a hand. <laughs> Patty, we're gonna do something that is so unlike you. Come on, come on, come on. (laughs) 
Come on up here, girl. You didn't know you were gonna be up on stage today, did you? Come on with me. We'll stand right here. We'll stand right here. Let me go get the mic. Hold on a second. Don't move. This, oh, this is my friend Patty. I'm gonna stand on this side of you. Everybody say hello to Patty. I know Patty, I know her husband Skip out here. Uh, we've cycled together, my buddy Tim James over here. We, we go cycling and they, they're here. So anyway, Patty, you, you've never been here before. No. And uh, look, are, are you nervous? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so whatever happens right now, promise me you, you might come back. I might come back. Okay. So here's what I want you to do. First of all, you've never been here. I want you to cross your arms like this. And I want you to look at, just look around at all these people and just kind of give them, the, give them the evil eye just a little bit. <laughs> and then repeat after me these words, okay? I'm gonna hold the mic here, but no, keep, keep your hands crossed. Repeat after me these words. I, I wonder. I wonder. No, I wonder. I wonder. What? What? All these. All these. Strange. Strangers. People, people have, have to offer to offer me me and then take your arms and do this and then go <clears throat> <clears throat> okay one more time I wonder I wonder what all these people what all these people have to offer have to offer me me good give her a hand give her a hand give her a hand now you stay right there I want everybody out here to take your arms and cross them just like this and repeat after me these words. I wonder, I wonder what this patty lady, what this patty lady has, has to offer me. To offer and you. they go, huh? Yeah. Okay, let's do it again. Okay, you're going first. I, arms crossed. I wonder, I wonder what all these people, what all these people have to offer, have to offer me, me. All you coming back? I want my man. Cross your arms out there. I wonder. Now don't move. Just look around. Okay. This is another Patty, the Patty that I know. Okay, say. I wonder. I wonder. What all these. What all these. Beautiful. Beautiful. Kind. Kind. Intelligent. Intelligent. People. People. Who came to church. Who came to church. Here's what I'm wondering. I'm wondering. I'm wondering. What gifts I have. What gifts I have. That I can use. That I can use. To serve. Put both hands out like this. To serve. To serve. All these. All these. Beautiful. Beautiful, kind, kind, intelligent, intelligent, lovely, lovely people. People. Now, all of you, put your arms out to Patty and repeat after me. Come on, sir, put your hands out. I wonder what gifts I have. Point to yourself that I can use to serve this wonderful, beautiful, lovely, talented, charming woman named Patty. Now, when that happens, Patty leaves this church thinking this is the greatest church in the United States of America. You go down the street. She's a trooper right there. All right, so first base is what? What's first base? Salvation in who? Jesus Christ. What's second base? What's third base? Every single person in this room is good at something. You should come into this church every week not wanting just to warm a chair, but to think about what gifts you have that you can use to serve the body of Christ. I will tell you this is true, this is not fiction. This is an old law that about, they say 20% of the people do 80% of the work. And I think it's more like 10%. I think 10% of the people do about 90% of the work. I don't know if you've ever seen the illustration with the guy in the circus, he's got, a, he's got a pole and he's got a plate on top and he spins the plate like this and then he runs over and he grabs this plate and he puts it on the pole and he spins it, he runs it over here. This is what a pastor does. 
He's constantly trying to keep things going at the church. And he's running here, and this person gets their feelings hurt, so he's got to get, they're about to leave, he's got to get it going. This person, yeah, he's, they, they're not coming, they got to get that going. And he just spends his whole time just trying to spin plates. And what we need, what the Lord needs, what the kingdom of God needs, what this city needs, is that every single person that walks in these doors is not thinking, I wonder what this church has to offer me, but instead asking yourself, what gifts, what talents, what abilities that you have that you can use to bless this body of Christ? And that's when this church goes from here to here as far as its influence in this city. So, all right? Now, home plate, home plate, you got this. Home plate is what? You should know this, it's heaven. Home plate is heaven. First base is Christians is being committed to Jesus Christ. Second base is the church. Third base is Christian service. When you get home, that's, that's a place called heaven. And I believe inside the heart of every man is a longing. There's something that's in there. It's like a homing pigeon that God put inside of you to get to a place called heaven. Whenever a social worker goes into a slum area and is sickened by what he or she sees, and they clench their fist and they say, this horrible place, these horrible places, they have to go. Human beings shouldn't have to live in this squalor. Whether you realize it or not, he is subconsciously projecting an inner hunger for a world that is minus poverty and filth. And every time a politician or a statesman tries to devise a solution to war, whether they realize it or not, they are projecting an inner feeling and a hunger for a world minus bloodshed and death. And whenever a doctor or a scientist goes into a laboratory and seeks to find a cure for cancer, whether they realize it or not, God has placed something within them where they are searching and hungering for a world minus sickness and pain. And whenever a person suffers through personal heartache and they ask that question that has been asked more than any other question, the question of why, why am I suffering? Why me? Why this? Why now? What that person, whether they realize it or not, subconsciously or maybe even consciously, they are longing for a place where there's no more sorrow. There are three things that make me excited about going to heaven. I've got three reasons why I can't wait to get there. Number one are all the things that won't be there. There's not going to be any bad breath. There'll be no cavities, no receding hairlines. No glasses, no wrinkles, no bulging waistlines, no cellulite, yes I said that. There'll be no freeways, no smog, no pollution, no bounce checks, no flat tires, no mosquito bites, no hurricanes, no earthquakes, no tornadoes. There won't be any hatred, there'll be no bitterness, there'll be no prejudice in heaven. There'll be no racism in heaven. There'll be no abuse in heaven. There'll be no cursing. There won't be any drive-by shootings. There won't be ambu ambulances. There'll be no sorrow, no sickness, no disease, no divorce, no hospitals, no cancer, no crying, no heartache, no suicide, no crime, no fighting, no war, no mortuaries, no funeral homes, no violence, no farewells. There'll be no more death. I can't wait to get there for all the things that won't be there. But I'm also excited about going to heaven because of the things that will be there. Because the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 21 that the streets are paved with gold. The Bible tells us that there are 12 gates and each gate is made of a single pearl. Imagine how large that pearl's gonna be. The Bible tells us that in heaven the walls are made of jasper. That means they are clear as crystal. And, and the Bible tells us that it's the, a city that is made of pure gold. And the foundations are made of every imaginable precious stone and the brightness of God will give it its light and there'll be no darkness There'll be no night because it will always be bright because of God. So heaven's gonna be great because of what's not there. It's gonna be great because of what's there, but the most important thing about heaven is because of who's there. 
And when I get back on a trip, I don't come home and rush, rush over to the curtains and rub my hands through the curtains as we prepare to close, we had the keyboard guy playing. As we, as we, I don't run home and put my hands through the curtains and go, oh, I've missed you curtains so much. I, I don't run over to the silver wardrobe, the drawer where all, all the utensils and open them up and I look at the spoons and the forks and I'm, I've missed you so much. No, what do we do when we get home from a trip? We go to our loved ones. And ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know that when you get to heaven, the most important thing that will be there will be Jesus Christ himself and you'll get to see him face to face. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be in the presence of the Lord and all God's people said. I wanna take you back 100 years. Go back with me in time 100 years. Can you do that? The year 1924. The World Series that year, 100 years ago, was played between New York and Washington. It came to a seventh game. It was a it was, uh, they say, it was one of the most remarkable World Series that had ever been played up to that point. Every game had been decided by one run, and it came to the seventh and final game. New York had won three games. Washington had won three games. The game was being played at Washington. It came to the ninth inning. The score was tied, three to three. New York came to bat in the top of the ninth. They had three up and three down. So now it's the bottom of the ninth. Washington, the home team, is at bat for a chance to win the World Series. The first two batters made outs, and the third batter was a man named Goose Goslin came to the plate. And on a pitch, two balls and two strikes. On the fifth pitch, Goose Goslin swings with all of his might and hits the ball out to left center field. Oh, it looked like it was gonna be a home run, and he takes off running around first base. He's headed towards second base, and the ball hits about six inches from the top of the wall, and the ball falls down into the field to play. And the outfielders run out there, and they bobble the ball. They don't pick it up, and it's rolling around. So he, leave, he, he turns the corner at second, and he's headed into third base for a triple. And the third base coach, Thanks to himself, this might be the only chance we have to win the World Series. And he waves him around for an inside the park home run. So he, he comes around third base, he sees the coach doing this, he picks up speed, he turns the corner, he's coming for the play at the plate, it's a bang bang play. It looks like by everyone who saw it that he slides across just barely safe and they make the tag it looked like he was safe but the umpire stands up and goes you're out and the crowd went crazy because he looked like he was safe the manager comes out they start to argue the umpires get everyone back in the dugouts they confer for a few minutes it seemed like a few hours they go up to the place where they make announcements, and here's what the umpire said. He said, ladies and gentlemen, the runner at home is out because he failed to touch first base. He failed to touch first base. It's time to go. I've run out of time. But I want to say to you, you got to touch all the bases. You don't want to get to a point in your life where you are right now and you think, well, I might be saved, I might not be saved. Have you ever put your faith and trust in Jesus? Have you ever repented? Have you ever confessed him to be the Lord of your life? Have you ever been baptized into his name? And at that moment, you're automatically part of the church. And you should be living every waking moment serving Jesus with every ounce of ability and talent you have, no matter how little, no matter how great, so that one day when you die, just like Freddie Freeman hit that home plate, when he jumps and he lands at home, that there's a wild celebration because you touched all the bases. Let's stand and bow our heads for a word of prayer. Ricky, you want to say this prayer? You want me to do it? Let me pray. Let me just pray. God, today I would just ask that you would be with every person who's here. Help them to take self 
inventory? Have they ever reached a point where they fully have committed their life to Jesus Christ? Not just in word, but they truly have trusted in you as their Lord and Savior. And at that moment, God helped them to realize that the at that moment, they, the only place they can be is the church. That, that puts them in the church automatically. It's not something that we, oh, we have to go. No, we want to go. This is where we belong. This is who we are. And then to spend every ounce of energy simply serving until it's time for us to go home and hear the Lord say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here who's not touched all the bases, that they'll do so today. Bless this church, bless every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl. We pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen, amen and amen. Thank you, Pastor Dudley Rutherford for that amazing message. We consider it a privilege to have such world-class speakers like Pastor Dudley come here from all over to help advance the good news of the gospel across the Coachella Valley and beyond. So from all of us here at Southwest Church, we can't wait to see you again soon. Have a great week and God bless.